Okay, I wonder if you agree with this. I think we're living in an age, uh, an age, a lawless sort of era, really, where um, the ideas of, of love and commands are perceived to be in two opposite and different camps. So people tend to think in terms of love being there and commandment and obedience and stuff being over there, and never the two should meet. That's nothing new. Uh, Judges 5 talks about every man doing what was right in his own eyes, what he, what he felt like. Uh, back in the days of the Judges, which is sort of, I don't know, is it Bronze Age or something like that, in, in Israel's very, very early history. And uh, nothing's changed. We've, we've got that same sort of situation around us now. It's a really lawless era where the ideas of love and commandment are perceived as being in two opposite directions. There's an assumed agreement in society, it seems to me, that to be loved, of course, is to be equal with no hierarchy in relationship <coughs> at all, and to be able to do exactly what one wishes with no requirement of any sort being made by the lover of the lovey, if you see what I mean. Does that make sense? The loving thing is not to make any requirement and not to have any strings attached at all. But the point is that love costs. Love costs. Not just giving it, but receiving it. Because it lays obligations and responsibilities on us from start to finish to be loved. Now, <clears throat> that's a piece of worldview that, that, that is kind of strange, and we need to confront things on this and, and rewrite stuff before any of us can begin to deal with the implications of genuine discipleship to Jesus Christ. That there could possibly be commandment or obligation in our relationship of such love. Because our world tells us that to be loved is to be unobliged in any direction, whatever. The consequences of and consistent proper response to being a person who has been loved by the Lord Jesus Christ, well, the answer to that kind of clashes with the worldview that surrounds us. Let me give you a human analogy that you really wouldn't doubt to ensure I'm communicating clearly here. Okay? Uh, <clears throat> okay, my wife is in the room. My wife loves me. This will be no great revelation to you. She stayed here all this long time. It must be true. Okay? So, my wife loves me. We just don't go on about it too much because it gets a little bit pukey and it embarrasses the children. But the fact that she does love me lays an obligation on me, doesn't it? It puts me under obligation to be trusted by somebody who, who loves me. If someone has given you their heart, and I'm thinking in terms of you know, their response to your affection. We're not talking about stalking here, okay? But, if, but if, if somebody has trusted me to love me, then I'm saying I have an obligation not to hurt that person, not to prevail on their love, not to use or abuse them. And that's a duty that's enshrined there in the laws of every land, isn't it? We understand, actually, the idea that to be loved puts us under obligation. Um, did you hear the Radio 4 News this morning? No? Yeah? Did you hear Paul Conroy and his wife? Did you hear that? Now that was really interesting. Paul Conroy was a colleague of Marie Colvin, who sadly died. We were praying about this last week, weren't we? We were talking about this last week. Uh, in, in Homs, in Syria. And Paul Conroy is another journalist, and he's, he's, he's come out of Homs. Apparently, he was riding down a tunnel on a motorbike as they were beginning to shell to close the end of the tunnel. That's close, isn't it? And he's injured and all the rest of it. He's come out of Homs and he's conscious, very conscious of the fact that people have died to get him out. And his wife was just so grateful, I want to do everything I can for them, she said. And, and, and he said, here's a quote from what he said, I wrote it down. I owe it to the people in there, I owe it to the people who died getting me out of there. To stand by those people now. We are conscious, aren't we, of, of the fact that it is perfectly legitimate for having received love, having received care, having received affection, to lay obligation upon us. And Christ has loved me, and Christ has deeply loved me, and as a genuine follower of Jesus, I will be deeply moved by that love. But the thing about being moved is it, it moves. <laughs> Something happens about it. I'm profoundly helped by his love, by his love and wisdom and his deity that are all mingled in together. My Lord has loved me with an everlasting love. And because he's my Lord, because of who he is, he knows me and he loves me. He's all wise and he loves me. He's all knowing and he loves me. Because I know I am none of those things myself, knowing, loving, 
wise stuff like that. His love is expressed towards me in commanding me into doing what's right and safe. It's an expression of his love that he tells me the right way to be going. And if you've got kids, you understand that. What, why does a good parent command a child? Is it because parent wants their own way? Now that's bad parenting, isn't it? Parents, good parents, command children because they do know better than the children and they know their child and they love their child and it's perfectly legitimate for them to command. It's an expression of their love and care. Of course it is. And the fact that they command doesn't make them bad parents. That's a myth. We will not get to grips with genuine discipleship to Jesus until we get away from the idea that the loving thing is to let the person love do what they feel like. Until we get away from the conception that love and commands are incompatible, the reverse is truly the case. And that's the ground we need to clear before we can begin to grapple with our passage today. So having done that, let's hit the text. John 15, 10 to 14. Here's what Jesus says. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love. Just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. So being loved and being commanded, not incompatible. They, they can be the same thing. Being full of joy and having been commanded are not incompatible. They can be completely the same thing. And Jesus says, verse 12, My command is this, Love each other as I have loved you. Greater love is no one than this, says Jesus, that he lay down his life for his friends. And you are my friends if you do what I command. Now, in, in our world, these the big ideas in these verses, as we've said, they're assumed to be simply incompatible. But that's just an inconsistent assumption, because we're not, we're not actually living along uh, with the outworking of that in our, in our relationships, in our daily lives. Just to be clear about what this verse is saying, I did you a wordle. Now you know how these things work? These things work on the basis that they pick up the number of words that occur most, that are emphasised most in a particular portion of prose or whatever you put in, and they make those bigger. And looking at that, the big thing that Jesus is talking about is commands in association with love, which is the next biggest thing, and joy, which is the next one. Now, do you see the point? There's the emphasis in that verse. If we are lawless and self-centered and assertive, self-assertive, then it's no wonder we've got problems with these verses. But if we're converted Christian people, we've repented of that. And our discipleship means we have submitted to Christ's loving authority. We finish with living out our life. We're committed to living out his life through us. And we've done that, we've come to that point in response to the love that he's shown us. It's what Paul talks about in Galatians 2.20. Therefore, I no longer live. Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. 